from around the globe. It's theCUBE, with coverage of KubeCon and CloudNativeCon North America 2020, virtual. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and Ecosystem Partners. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE, coming to you from our Palo Alto studios today with our ongoing coverage of KubeCon, Cloud Native Con, North America 2020. It's not really North America, it's virtual like everything else, but you know, they had the European show earlier in the summer and this is the, this is the late fall show. So we're excited to welcome in our very next two guests. Uh, first joining us from Madrid, Spain is Miguel Perez Colina. He is a principal product manager from Red Hat. Miguel, great to see you. Great to see you, happy to be in the Cube. Yes, great, well welcome. And joining us from North Carolina is Rich Sharples. He is the Senior Director of Product Management of Red Hat. Rich, great to see you. Yeah, likewise, thanks for inviting me again. Absolutely. So we're talking about Java today and before we kind of jump into it, you know, in preparing for this, Rich, I saw an uh, interview that you did, I think earlier, about halfway through the year, uh, celebrating the 25th anniversary of Java and talking about the 25th anniversary of Java. And before we kind of get into the future, I think it's worthwhile to take a look back at, you know, kind of where Java came from and how it's lasted for 25 years as such an important enterprise you know, kind of application framework, because we always hear jokes about people looking for COBOL programmers or, you know, all these old language programmers because they have some old system that's, <laughs> that needs a little assist. What's special about Java? Why are we 25 years into it and you guys are still excited about Java yesterday, yeah. today, and well, in the future? Yeah, I mean, I should add that um, in terms of languages, uh, 25 is actually still pretty young. Java's uh, kind of middle-aged, I guess. Um, you know, things like C, C++, are uh, you know, 45, 50 years old. Python, I think, is about the same uh, as, as as Java in terms of years. So you know, languages do tend to move at a um, at a. They do tend to stick around a, a fair bit. Well, what's made Java really, really important for enterprises building business critical applications is it started off with a very large ecosystem of big vendors supporting it. Um, it was you know, open in a sense from the very start. And it's remained open as in open source and an, an open community as, as well. So that's really, really helped, um, you know, keep the language innovating and moving along and attracting new developers. And um, it's it's still a fairly modern language in terms of some of the, 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 the new features. It's, it's really advancing with the industry, taking on new kinds of workloads and, new kinds of programming paradigms as well. So, you know, it's it's evolved very well and has a huge base. It has somewhere between 11 and 13 million uh, developers still use it as their primary development language in you know, professional uh, settings, yeah. What struck me about what you said though in that interview was kind of the evolution and how Java has been able to continue to adapt based on kind of what the new frameworks are. So whether it was early days in a machine, like you talked about being in a set-top box or you know, kind of really lightweight, uh, kind of almost IoT applications, then to becoming you know, this really uh, great application to deliver enterprise applications via a web browser. And, that it, you know, and it continues to, to morph and change and adapt over time. I thought that was pretty interesting given the vast change in the way applications uh, are delivered today versus what they were 25 years ago. Yeah, absolutely. It's, you know, the very early days were around embedded devices, uh, intelligent toasters and, you know, whatever. Um, and and then it, where it really, really took off was for, for building, supporting big backend systems, big transactional workloads, whether you're a bank or an airline, you're running both at scale, but also running really, really complex, you know, transactional systems that were business critical. And that's that's for the last you know 15 years has, has been um, where it's it's really shown building back end um, systems. Now as as we kind of move forward, you know the idea of a um, like server side a server side application versus a, a front end is kind of uh, changed. You know now we're talking microservices. We're talking about running in containers. So really the focus of where we run Java. And the kinds of applications we're building with Java has, has, has radically changed. And as such, the, the language has to change as well, which is you know, why I'm pretty excited to talk about Quarkus today. Yeah, so let's let's jump into it and talk about Quarkus, because the other big trend, you know, along with 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 obviously uh, 
browsers being great enterprise applications delivery vehicles is this thing called containers, right? And, and specifically, more recently, Kubernetes is the one that's grabbing all the attention and grabbing all the, all the momentum. Um, so I wonder, Miguel, if you could talk about, you know, kind of as, as the popularity of containerized applications and containerized everything, right? Containerized storage, we've even talked about containerized networking control, how that's impacted uh, what you guys are doing and the impact of Java uh, and making it work with kind of a containerized Kubernetes world. Well, with, what we found is that the paradigm of development has changed. So we have this sort of factor up uh, uh, paradigm that the people are following to be able to do the best with containers, do the best with Kubernetes. And uh, this has worked quite fine in Greenfield. And for, for many cases, it's been a, a way to develop applications faster, to be able to obtain better results. And the thing is that for many uh, users, for many companies that we work with, uh, they also want to bring some of their stuff, that they, the applications that are currently running into this world. And uh, I mean, we, we work especially a lot in, in helping these customers be able to adapt those applications, but we try to do it in, uh, as we say, it, the no, no pixie dust. You know, we really dig into the, the code, we review the code, we modernize the application, we help the customer modernize the application, we provide the tools that are open for anyone to be able to review it and to be able to check it. So we are moving away from greenfield into brownfield and not, not away, we are evolving together to say, to be more precise, you know, all these greenfield applications keep coming, but also the current applications want to be modernized. Right, right. So it's pretty interesting because that, that's always the big conversation. There's, it's, it's all fine and good if you're just building something new. Uh, to use the latest tools, but as you mentioned, there's a whole lot of conversation about application modernization. And this is really an opportunity uh, to apply some of these techniques to do that. So Quercus, I wonder if you just get, let's just jump into it. What is it at the highest level? Uh, what's it all about? What should people know? Yeah, so, so Quercus is um, uh, really an attempt by Red Hat to ensure Java is a first-class citizen in containerized environments for building reactive applications, uh, cloud-native applications, uh, functions. Java is an incredible piece of engineering. It does some incredible things. It um, can self-optimize as it's running. It can inline code. It can do some really amazing things the longer it runs. But in a containerized environment, you're likely not going to be running, you know, um, huge amounts of code, you're likely to be running microservices, and your your services are likely to have a kind of limited life cycle as we uh, you're able to deploy more frequently or in a function environment where you know you invoke once and then you're done. Um, you know, doing all those long um, kind of um, the, those optimizations over time don't really um, make a lot of sense. So, what we can do is, is remove a lot of the, um, the weight of Java, a lot of the complexity of Java, and we can optimize for, a, for an environment where your code is maybe just running for a few microseconds, as in, in the case of a function or something running in, in native, as you scale up and scale down. So we move a lot of the optimize, we, we move a lot of the, um, the, the effort within the application uh, to compile time, we you know, pre-compile all of your, your config and the initialization. So that doesn't have to happen in your, um, you know, your, your runtime or your production environment. Um, and then we can optimize the code. We, we, can, we can remove dead code. We can remove you know, whole uh, trees of class libraries and really slim down the, the memory footprint and you know, radically um, slim the memory footprint. Um, increase the startup time as well. So, you know, you have less dead time in your applications. Um, and we've recently done a, a study with IDC that shows some pretty stunning um, results compared to, you know, some existing frameworks. And, you know, we get, um, you know, up to like, you know, overall cost savings of, you know, 60, 64%. Um, we can get eight, eight times better density. You're running more in a, in a, in a cluster and um, you know, reduction in memory up to 90% as well. So it's, these are significant changes. Now that's all good, you know, saving, saving 60, 
60 percent on your your operational costs is significant but what we find is that m most organizations they come for the performance and the optimizations but what they actually stay for is the speed of development so i think i think caucus real um silver bullet is um the developer productivity you know for organizations the cost of development is still one of the major costs. I mean, the operational costs, the hosting costs are significant, but development costs, time to market will always be top of mind for organizations that are trying to move faster than the competition. And I think that's really where um, um, Caucus, especially when coupled in a, you know, in an OpenShift or Kubernetes environment really, really does shine. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. So people can go to quarkus.io and, and see a lot of the statistics that, that you just referenced in terms of memory usage and speed and, and, and a whole bunch of stuff. But what struck me when I went to the site was, that, was this big uh, uh, two words that jumped out, developer joy. And it's funny that you talked on that just now about really um, the benefits that come to the developer directly to make them happier. <laughs> I mean, really calling out their joy. So they're more productive. And ultimately that's what you said, that's where the great value is in terms of speed of deployment, happy developers and productive developers. You know, Miguel, you get your, you get down into the weeds of this stuff. Again, you, the presentations on your LinkedIn, everyone needs to go look. And you talk a lot about uh, app migration and you lot, talk a lot about app modernization. So without going through all 120 some odd slides that I think you have, which is, good phenomenal information. What are some of the top things that people need to think about and consider both for app modernization as well as app migration? Um, that's, that's, uh, <laughs> that's a very interesting question. Uh, the thing is that um, the tooling is important and uh, the current code is important. And the thing is that normally when, when we start a migration project, we try to find archetypes in the applications to be able to find patterns. You know, you find patterns is much easier because uh, once you solve one pattern, the same pattern can be solved in a very similar way. So this is one of the parts that, that we focus a lot, but before getting to that point, it's very important on how you start. You know? So the assessment phase is, is very important to be able to review where, what is the status of the applications, the context of the applications. And with that, I mean things like, for example, the requirements that they have, the, the maintenance that they're taking, their resiliency and so on. So you have to prepare very well the, the project by starting with a good assessment. You have to check which applications makes more, make more sense to start with and see which how to group them together by similarities. And then you can start with the project that saying, okay, let's go for this set of applications that make more sense, that are more likely to be containerized because of the way we are developing them because of the dependencies that they have, because of the resiliency that is already embedded into them and so on. So that, that the methodology is important. And we normally, for example, when we, when we help partners uh, do uh, application migration, one of the things that we stress is, uh, look, this is the methodology that we follow. And in the website for migration to for application, you can find also a methodology uh, part that uh, could help uh, people understand, okay, these are, these are the stages that we normally follow to be successful when migrating applications. Yeah, and Miguel, you don't, we're not friends, we don't hang out a lot, but if we did, you would know I never ever recommend PowerPoint for anything. So, so the fact that I'm calling out your okay. PowerPoint actually means something because I think it's the worst application ever built, but you got some tremendous, Very tremendous information in there and, and people do need to go in and look. And again, it's all from your LinkedIn. We're, but I wanted to, to shift gears a little bit, right? We're at KubeCon Cloud Native Con. Um, obviously it's virtual, it's 2020, that's the way of the world today. But I'm just curious to get your guys' take on, on what does this uh, event mean for you? Obviously, really active open source community, you know, Red Hat has a long open source history. Um, what does KubeCon, Cloud Native Con mean for you guys? What do you hope to get out of it? What should people hope to, uh, to learn from Red Hat? Yeah, we, um, yeah, we're, we're by you know, our DNA, we're very, very collaborative. Uh, we, we love to learn from our customers, users of, of the technologies um, in the communities that we support. Um, speaking as a, you know, we're both product guys, there's nothing better than getting with um, people who actually use the products um, in, in anger in, in real life, whether they're products or upstream technologies, learning, learning what, they're, what they're doing, 
understanding where um, some of the gaps are. There's, um, you know, we just couldn't do our jobs without you know, engaging with developers, users um, in these kind of conferences. Yeah, a lot of the um, a lot of the interest we've seen with Quarkus is is in the community. You know, um, I've, I've been part of many many successful open source projects um, um, at Red Hat, and it's great when your customers, you know, like uh, Vodafone Greece or Carrefour in Spain, are, are openly publicly talking about how good your technology is, what they're using it for. Uh, and that's really good. So it's just nothing. There's there's no alternative to the, you know, whether it be virtual, virtually or physically, sitting down with the with the users of your technology. How about you, Miguel? What are you hoping to get out of uh, out of the show this year? Um, we are working a lot on, on Kubernetes in in Red Hat, and uh, as part of the community, of course. And um, I mean, there are so many new stuff that is coming around Kubernetes that uh, it's mostly about it, about all the capabilities that we're adding, especially for example, serverless. You know, serverless is, a, is, is an important topic with Quarkus because for example, as you make the application start so much faster and uh, react so much faster, you could have none of them running and just waiting for an event to happen, which saves a lot of resources and makes you super efficient. So this is one of the topics, for example, that we wanted to, to cover in, in this edition, you know, how we are implementing serverless with Kubernetes and OpenShift and many other things like pipelines, like, I don't know. Uh, we just recorded recently a, a video a live on what is coming on OpenShift 4.6, and I recommend people to take a look at it to get everything that's new because there's a lot. Yeah. So that would be for me. Yeah, you guys are technical people. You've been doing this for a long time. Why is Kubernetes so special? Why, why, you know, there's been containers in the past, right? And we've seen other kind of branded open source projects that got a lot of momentum, but Kubernetes just seems to be blowing everybody out of the, out of its path. Why, what should people know about Kubernetes that aren't necessarily developers? And well, why do they need to pay attention? Yeah, there's, there's, there's really nothing interesting about a single container or a, or a single microservice, right? That's not, that's not the kind of environment that, um, that real organizations live in. They live in organizations where they're going to have hundreds of services, um, hundreds of containers, and you need a technology to orchestrate and manage that, in, that complex environment. And Kubernetes has just quickly become the, the de facto standard. Um, yeah, folks at Red Hat jumped on that very, very early. Um, I mean, one of the advantages Red Hat have is we're, we're embedded with developers and open source communities, we, we often have a pretty good, it gives us a pretty good crystal ball. So we're often quick to jump on emerging technologies that are coming out of open source. And that's exactly what happened with, with Kubernetes. It was clear it was, um, you know, going to be sophisticated for our, you know, most um, most sophisticated customers running at scale, um, but, but also, you know, uh, great for development environments as well. So really a good fit for uh, where we were headed and yeah, it just very, very quickly became de facto standard and, and you you just got to go with the de facto standard, right? Right, right. Well, the another thing that you mentioned, Rich, in that other interview that I was watching is, is it came up the conversation in terms of managing open source projects. And at some point, you know, they kind of start and then, you know, I think this one, if I go to Quarkus and look at the bottom of the page sponsored by Red Hat, but you talked about, you know, at some point, do you move it over to a foundation? Um, you know, and kind of what are the yeah. things that kind of drive that process, that decision? Um, and, you know, I, I would imagine that part of it has to do with popularity and scale. Is that something, you know, potentially down the road? How, how do you think of that? You said you've been in lots of open source projects. When does it move from, you know, kind of single point of, of origin to more of a foundational support approach? Yeah, I mean, foundations aren't always necessary. Um, you know, when you have a, yeah, if, if you have a, a, an open, a very open project with um, um, clear, clear rules for collaboration and, you know, kind of that encouragement for others to collaborate and be able to, you know, um, move the project, then, you know, a foundation isn't always necessary. What we've seen, I've been part of you know, the, the Node.js world where, you know, the, the community really felt that um, to keep Node.js moving forward, um, we had to go from a, what we call a you know, benevolent dictator for life, somebody who's well-intentioned, but um, you know, really wants to own the technology, 
to a foundation which is much more inclusive and um you know greater collaboration and you can move even quicker so you know um i, I think what's required is is open governance for open source projects and where that doesn't happen you know maybe a foundation is, is the right way forward right right now with with quarkus um you know the the non Red Hat developers seem pretty happy with the way they can get uh, get engaged and um, contribute. Um, but if we get to a point where the community is demanding a foundation, then yeah, we'll absolutely consider it. Yeah, you know, if that's the best for the, for the project, we'll do it. That's great. So, so we're we're coming to the end of our time. I want to give you each the last word, really, with two questions. One, again, you know, just kind of a summary of of uh, of, of KubeCon, Cloud Native Con. You know, what should people be looking for? Uh, find you and 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 I don't know if you guys are sponsoring any sessions. I'm sure there's a lot of great content if you want to highlight one or two things. And then most importantly, as we turn the calendars, we come to the end of 2020, uh, thankfully. Um, as you look ahead to 2021, you know what are some of your priorities uh, as as we get ready to turn the uh, turn the calendar? And Miguel, let's start with you. So um, I mean, we have been working very hard this year on the migration toolkit for applications to help uh, every user that is using Java to bring it to to containers. You know, whether it is JEE or it is Quarkus, uh, but we're putting like a lot of effort in in Quarkus, and uh, we are bringing new rules. And uh, by the by December, we expect to have the new version of of the migration toolkit for applications that is going to include uh, all the rules to help developers bring their, their code to, the Java code to, to Quarkus. And, uh, and uh, this, this is the, the main goal for us right now. We are moving forward to the next year to include more, more capabilities in that project. Everything is open source. You can go to the conveyor uh, project and check it and, uh, and add capabilities for the assessment phase. So whenever any partner, any, any of our Red Hat consultants are working on, on migration, or anyone that would like to go and try it themselves and adopt it, would like to do these migrations to, to the cloud native world, uh, would feel comfortable with, with this tool. So that is our, our main goal in, in, my, in my team. All right, and how about you, Rich? Yeah, I think we're going to see this um, um, kind of solidification of kind of web of um, microservices, um, you know, 2.0, if you like, I hate that, I'm sorry. But um, this kind of next generation microservices is going to be, as Miguel mentioned, is going to be based around um, uh, native um, eventing, um, serverless functions. I, I think that's really the 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 ideal architecture for for building microservices uh, on, on on Kubernetes, and Quarkus plays really really well there. Um, I think there's there's a there's a kind of backlog of projects um, within organizations that. Um, you know, hopefully next year, everything really does start to, to, to crank up. And I think, um, yeah, I think a lot of the migration that, that Miguel's talked about is going to be, is going to rise in terms of importance. So um, app modernization, taking those existing applications, maybe taking aspects of those and, you know, doing some kind of decomposition into microservices using Quarkus and, uh, and native. I think we'll see a lot of that. So I think we'll see a real drive around both the uh, kind of greenfield um, applications, uh, you know, this next generation of, of microservices, as, as well as pulling those existing applications forward into these new environments like Kubernetes. So it's going to be pretty exciting. Awesome. Well, thank you both for, for taking a few minutes with us and sharing the story of Quarkus. Uh, and have a great show. Great to see you and uh, really Thanks. enjoyed the conversation. Thanks, Thank Rob. Yeah. All right, he's Miguel, he's Rich, I'm Jeff. You're watching the Cube's ongoing coverage of KubeCon Cloud Native Con 2020 North America virtual. Thanks for watching, we'll see you next time. Sure.